Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Osher Map Library and Smith Center for Cartographic Education's Monday Map Lunch, the March edition. Uh, we are happy to have you with us. It is a rather interesting day here in Maine as we are encased in ice and many of our friends around us are still very much without power. We had a very destructive storm this weekend, but we are safe and warm in Portland at the MAP Library and happy to welcome you with us today for a Monday MAP Lunch with Dr. Matthew Edney. And we are going to be doing a deep dive into the printing process of promolithography and also some context on the history and the intersection of mapping and color. Um, and this goes along with our current exhibition that was curated by Matthew that he will talk more about over the course of his talk, Pageant of Spectacles, Chromolithography in America. If you haven't been to Portland to see it yet, we will have that exhibit up until June 29th. So still plenty of time to get here. And I won't steal Matthew's thunder, but if you can get here to see it, we're gonna have a nice little printed thing at the end um, for you to be able to work with. So my name is Libby Bischoff. I'm the executive director of the Osher Map Library. I am here only in introductory purposes today to introduce my two colleagues, Dr. Matthew Edney in one moment, and our operations and communications manager, Kelsey Reardon. Kelsey will be moderating the Q&A at the end. Uh, we'll ask you to hold your questions until the end of Matthew's talk, but you are more than welcome to put them in the chat. Um, and then Kelsey will read them from the chat or ask you to unmute during the Q&A portion. We've got um, two classes in the MAP library right, right now, so I will be ducking out to help our art historians on their research and then ducking back in. So without further ado, it is my great pleasure to introduce my next door office neighbor and friend and colleague, Dr. Matthew Edney. Matthew is the Osher Professor in the History of Cartography here at the University of Southern Maine, where he is also a Professor of Geography Anthropology. Many of you know him also as the Director of the History of Cartography Project of the University at the University of Wisconsin. He is the co-editor of Volume 4, Cartography and the European Enlightenment. We would be here until April's Monday Map Lunch if I was to list all Matthew's honorifics and publications. But suffice to say that most recently, he is the author of Cartography, The Ideal and Its History, University of Chicago, still working on the follow-up, um, which will come to you all soon, no doubt. But Matthew is the person I know who knows the most about maps, and I know that he has very much enjoyed this past year as he's taken a super deep dive into chromolithography and into color and mapping. So thanks so much, everybody, for being with us this afternoon. Matthew, I turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Libby. Um, <clears throat> yes, very nice introduction. Thank you. Um, I see some people out there who are um, who know a lot more about printing than I do, so hopefully I will not say anything too wrong about this. So anyway, let me just start sharing, and I hope you all see the nice title screen. Um, and I'm just going to kill that. There we go. Cool. So um, the title will become apparent in a few minutes. Uh, I would like to say in the lower left corner, mappingasprocess.net, it is where I blog, is where I uh, also post copies of most everything I publish. So if you're interested, go look there. And click in here. Yeah, here we go. So as Libby said, we did this exhibit. Um, it opened last November. Uh, called the Pageant of Spectacles, Chrome and Orthography in America. Here are a couple of shots of the exhibit gallery. Uh, it's a fun exhibit, a uh, torture to hang, given that we have uh, normally like 40 items in this show, in this exhibit space, 40, 45. And this exhibit has 92 items. And Libby wanted to hang them 
more like a 19th century gallery rather than uh, a more modern hanging. So it's a fairly dense uh, display. And again, why are you having problems? So I'd like to, uh, I dedicated the exhibit and all of these talks I'm doing around it uh, in part to Harold Osher, here he is with Peggy, who I just have to say had the most unerring sense of color I've ever met. Um, and any questions about do colors match, Peggy was perfect on that response. Um, Harold, many years ago, happened to mention that he liked, really liked chromolithographic maps. And in saying that, um, I think he had this kind of map in mind, a number of these in his own collection. Um, very sort of picturesque bird's eye views uh, produced late 19th, early 20th century. And I'll come back to some of these a bit later. But I'm also thinking about, uh, well, dedicating the exhibit uh, to this gentleman, David Woodward, my graduate advisor. Um, David was very much driven by questions about how do production techniques influence or determine the look of maps. <coughs> Pardon me. And in this respect, uh, he wrote his dissertation on a practice called serography, uh, like which produced this map, which is very uh, type heavy, uh, very modern style, as far as he was concerned, yet something that was produced in the late 19th century. I'm not going to talk about serography again because it's just it's just way too confusing to get into that topic today. So when I agreed uh, to do a show and I selected um, in just my my turn to do one, um, and I decided to do it in chromolithography, partly it was to honor Harold's passion for chromolithography and the mapping and views that come from it but also to do what David did and to think about what are the relationships between chromolithography and other kinds of color mapping and, and ways in which mapping color was applied to printed maps um, in the long period of uh, map history in the, from the 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th and 20th centuries. So the talk today um, is about chromolithography in America. I'll come back to what exactly chromolithography is. And I do use a very specific meaning for it to enable to, to be clear about different kinds of mapping and different kinds of printing techniques. So chromolithography requires me to talk about chroma. And that requires me to talk about lithography. And if you're going to understand lithography as a general audience, the best way to do that is to have some introduction to the mechanical methods of wood and copper printing and how they get used for, for color or not, as the case may be. Um, and I might as well then have a brief commentary about color and mapping and a conclusion as well. So this is the outline of the talk. And my conclusion is basically that chromolithography was used to image, in a sense, uh, to create visual images of the world visualizations, but also to, to, to see the world in, in its spectacular moments. And you know, I'll show you what I mean by this. So that's the title of the, of the exhibit, A Pageant of Spectacles. So color and mapping. Um, you know, obviously color is implicit in um, the work of manuscript mapping, drawing by hand. And here on the screen left is the uh, one of the draftsmen of Adam Friedrich Zerner drawing one of the county maps of the Atlas of Saxony, uh, all done by hand and inevitably with color to some degree. I mean, some people use just pen and ink, but a lot of people use color in drawing early maps. I'm not really concerned with that here. Um, Oops. One thing to basic rule of thumb is that before the middle of the 18th century, middle of the 19th century, sorry, almost every map, printed map that's colored was actually colored by hand using watercolors primarily. Um, and you can see on the detail from this uh, map of Maine, actually a serigraphic map, um, 
the, the color, at least in the vignette around the corners, from in the in the in the in the corners of the map, were applied by hand, and I've used arrows to point the various smudges, um, and where the where the watercolor pet, uh, brush lingered just a bit too long, uh, and so on. Watercolor, uh, watercolor was effectively the cheapest way of of applying um, color to most maps. Uh, essentially through uh, piecework going out, starting in the 16th century, certainly going out to women and children who were employed uh, very cheaply uh, to color maps um, for publishers or for anybody else. Um, the New York Evening Post is advertising the work of Mrs. Finlayson, who was the daughter of, um, and I'm blanking on his name, uh, Scotsman Publishing in Philadelphia in the early Republic, who made the first big map of America, and it will come to me in about five seconds. So, uh, problem going off topic. Anyway, the other thing about color is that when you do get into printing color, um, there's an issue with the way in which the colors are overprinted. Um, and if they don't match up properly, there's, they're said to be not in, in register or the registration is bad. So I keep coming back to this term registration um, as we go through the, the talk. And here you can see um, from Iyagi 1887, how the red uh, lines are somewhat upwards, uh, displaced consistently upwards on the page, suggesting there's a the registration error in the in the, the printing place aren't properly aligned when the page is printed. So printing goes back um, in a couple of techniques, both of which actually predate Gutenberg and the idea of movable type, at least in the West, uh, wood block and copper plate. Um, woodcuts are kind of relief printing in that the ink, uh, uh, you cut away the top of the surface, what you don't want to show, and I'll give you an example of this in a moment. And then on what's left standing proud, you apply the ink, and then you press the paper down onto the ink and peel the paper back and the ink sticks to the paper, and lo, you have a printed image. It is just like a potato print. Now, potato print, you're pushing the block down onto the paper, but and this actually talks to how uh, this technique began uh, for printing, um, making prints on cloth going back well into the Middle Ages. Here's an example from 18th century uh, French encyclopedia, the great encyclopedia, of a printing printing uh, presses in, in use. On the left, you have uh, somebody fixing to the tin pan piece of paper while his colleague is busily inking up all the type that's in the bed of the press. Then the thing sticking up the frisket comes down. It masks the paper to only print where there is letters on the in the in the bed of the press. Whole thing's folded down, rolled in and on the right, once it's rolled in, uh, a single pull on um, by the hand um, will impress the paper, push it down onto the inked up relief surface. So this is what a wood block will look like. Um, I just got to say, if you ever go to Antwerp, you've got to go to the Plantime Moretta's house. It is just the most amazing um, museum um, of printing um, from the Renaissance. It's just amazing place. Anyway, so this is one of their wood blocks they had on the wall. Um, there's a gap in the lower left of as you look at it because they would actually put letters of uh, bits of type in there to make the, the title. Um, and you can see that the, there's a design at the top, the standing proud, and everything else has been cut away. So here's a more detail. You can see the, how the wood has been cut away to leave uh, at the bottom, a rather ornate spray at the top of the cartouche, and at the top, um, the lettering. Friesi Pars, part of Friesland, 
Notice that everything on the woodblock is what's called wrong reading. It's inverted, it's mirror reading. Um, so that when you actually print the surface, it's going to print right reading. Um, so when you're thinking about printing processes, and in the 19th century, when, when a lot of uh, processes involve taking of molds um, and things, then you always have to think in terms of what's right reading, what's wrong reading, and how they're going back and forth between them. Now, you can actually print uh, with wood um, quite easily. Wood blocks, you can have large areas of color, large blocks of color. You can see it in the um, in the map on the left. You got areas of shading, but rather blocks. Um, you can do it here. So this is from the 1513 Strasbourg Geography, uh, maps by Martin Valsimuller. And this is a three color print in uh, green, black, and red. Every single instance of this map is different uh, because the registration is actually was was not they, they didn't take great care with the registration so on every single impression of this map there's a, a a different slightly different patterning of color and as the top right example on the right shows they also are some copies with yellow watercolor subsequently added to the printed image um, so everyone is different fine I could go on more about this stuff till the cows come home. It's just that probably it's just too much like hard work, um, not cost effective to do this kind of printing um, more frequently. And then there's very few map related woodblock printing. There's a fair number of artistic woodblock color printing, but not for maps other than really this puppy. Copper, on the other hand, uh, is a reverse of, of relief. It's called intaglio, which is that uh, Italian for engraving or etching. And in intaglio printing, you have the, the metal, the copper plate, later on it's going to be steel, and you, are, you make cuts into the plate, and those cuts are going to hold the ink. And then you've got to clean off the ink, which is a tedious process. And then you can press the paper down and it has to be really high pressure uh, to get the paper down into the grooves within the copper plate in order to pick up the ink. So when you peel the paper back, the ink goes with the paper. <clears throat> so here again from the uh, encyclopedia is a image of an 18th century rolling press is a rolling press and you're literally jamming the copper plate, the inked up copper plate, the paper, and some layers of felt protection between two rollers, which are seen sort of end on here. And the print, printer is actually using both hand, both hands and a foot to pull down and push with his foot to force this um, assembly through the rollers to really push the paper down. The paper's also wet a bit, so it's a bit puffy, so it'll reach down into the grooves a bit. And at the same time, the heat, the, the copper plate is also warm uh, as you heat up metal, it expands so that the all the nice, neat grooves expand ever so slightly to allow paper to get down into the grooves a bit better. On the right, you've got uh, one figure, figure A, is the guy who's inking up the plate, and figure B at the far right is now is in the process of cleaning off the surface of the ink uh, with progressive degrees of fine uh, cloth. And then at the far right, you've got the brazier. So every time the, the plate starts to cool down, you stick it on that. And there are some images where people are actually doing this work on the plate, on the brazier. So the plate is hot and... Uh, there's the assembly of the plate going through the rollers. Intaglio printing, the rolling press is so high pressure that the paper is actually permanently, permanently deformed as it's pushed around the edge of the copper plate, leaving what's often called the plate mark. And you can see it quite clearly here in this image of raking light, uh, how the uh, paper has permanently deformed. 
in this kind of situation where the copper plate has different expansion because you're heating it and it's cooling and the paper is wet and it dries off and shrinks a bit in the process there's not much control over the the actual precise size of the plate or of the paper so it's actually really hard in copper printing to copper plate printing to to maintain good registration but that didn't stop some people from trying to get over the, the problems of copper and, and try to do color printing. In the case of uh, Jacques Nicolas Balin in the mid 18th century, he seems to have gotten frustrated with drawing all the lines going every which way on this map. And so uh, he experimented with um, printing those from a second plate, which he could color. We have this one in red, we have another one in green color uh, for the second print. And if you look very carefully, you can see at the far right that there are um, there's a hole right where that red line ends. Uh, now that's a pin. Um, that's a hole to to allow the pin to sit in um, within the copper plate to ensure some degree of registration uh, as you go forward. It's not necessarily the best. I'm going to go back. Sorry. Um, because even at this scale, at the top right corner, you can see that there are actually two plate marks, uh, one for each plate, which are quite far apart. Copper plate, color printing, again, lots of experiments, but not really implemented um, for map making. And Belin very quickly uh, abandoned the idea and went back to single plate monochrome printing again. So then we come to lithography, um, which is a wonderfully chemically complex process. And because it's chemical and the chemical reactions can be done in multiple ways, 19th, 20th century lithography takes on multiple forms and it doesn't really, it's very hard to get a handle on basically. So I'm just giving you a very basic level because that's really where my brain is at. Lithography is a planar technique, which means that it uses a plane surface. The story that Eloy Senefeld had told is that he was he found a, a, a block of limestone, maybe in a, a decorative element where he was living, and in the garden, and he realized it is very consistently fine grain nature. He thought, oh, maybe I can I can etch this with acid to make a printing surface so I can print my my play scripts and scores. He was a, a actor and a playwright musician. Maybe I can print my work a bit more cheaply. Um, didn't really work, but he then found that the very greasy substance he was using as a ground around which to to cut away the uh, stone surface with um, with acid actually held ink really well. And by 1798, 96, he had perfected what he calls lithography. Uh, well, Stein's are up in stone printing, but French school lithography, sorry. And lithography is essentially where you have a, uh, a greasy substance that's applied to the smooth surface of particular kinds of limestone, uh, initially only out of Solnhof, and they found plenty of other quarries that have similar kinds of stone. By the 1840s, people are trying to uh, quite successfully use zinc plates as an alternative um, matrix for this kind of printing. But either way, you get a smooth surface that takes a greasy substance that holds the ink, and when you wipe away the rest of the ink with water or other solutions, um, all that ink is removed and you're just left with the ink sitting on the greasy substance. So when you then impress the paper and peel the paper back, you end up with the ink sticking to the paper where you want the ink to be. And it looks something like this in practice. Now, the kicker here is that um, Lithographers found very, very, very quickly that you can transfer images back and forth from 
other materials and lithographic stones uh, to a printed image, which you can then transfer to a new lithographic stone. And you end up with essentially sort of like 19th century clip art. And here's one of our great examples, cottage ornament from 1858. All of the images on this is, is almost like a collage has come from some other stone where it is stored and then used in this device and the publishers use all these different, different little vignettes and little icons and maps for a whole host of other products as well. So they, they're sharing images across multiple stones. Running out of time. So already. Um, lithography, again, you can print just monochrome, just a black image, maybe sepia, but normally black on paper like this map of bird's eye view with great falls down in uh, on the main New Hampshire border. Um, but you can also overprint, and they started doing this quite early in the 1840s, you can overprint, 1820s, sorry, um, washes of color. So in this bird's eye view by the same artist and the same publisher in the same year, we've got broad areas of blue and broad areas of green have been overprinted onto the black face um, to give a slightly different look. This is often called a tinted lithography. Uh, it's sort of the beginnings of color lithography. It's relatively straightforward, it's relatively simple. Then you've got the kind of printing um, as on this glorious item, which has seen better days, I think, uh, in which you have very discrete areas of color being printed, uh, not overlapping each other, but there's a bit of registration problem here. Um, we might as well just call this color lithography to be precise. Uh, you can find it in all sorts of geological mapping, decorative mapping, all kinds of thematic mapping, government reports through the 19th century. US official engineers, military and civil, uh, adopted a completely different technique uh, one that's properly, <laughs> properly not described by any art historian because it's never used for art. Uh, and that is to capture some of the look of European territorial mapping by using copper plates, but engraving three copper plates, one for blue for water, one in brown, one for brown contour lines, and one to be printed in black for everything else, cultural features, marginalia. And then to print them, because copper is soft, and you want to preserve the copper, the uh, each copper plate fresh impression was then transferred to a lithographic stone, prepare that stone, and then that's used for the mass production of images. So it's lithographically printed, but from a copper and three copper plates. Which brings me to chromolitho, finally. So chromolithography is a process, um, and I, so I'm using it very precisely for this process, in which you layer multiple, multiple colors on top of each other without a black line foundation. You know, you don't have uh, the black lines that appear in National Bouquet, nor all the black base that you get in a tinted litho. Rather, you take what's, a, what's called a key, key drawing wireframe in modern day digital parlance, and you apply that to every single stone that's gonna print each particular color in sequence. This itself is not printed into the final image. This is what's used to design the stones that will then print multiple copies. So uh, in this case, we have uh, the first color printed, and the second color that would be printed. And you put the two together, and they look something like this. And you keep doing this. In this case, this example uh, gives you 22 different colors. So you can add the third, the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth. The sixth is in just a little bit of highlight. And you get a bit more complex. Add the seventh, the eighth, the ninth, and the tenth layers. And the image starts building up into, into more complexity and so on. This is uh, colors 1 through 14, 1 through 18, and 1 through 22 to give you the final image, which is a, a ornate Japanese lacquered box. 
is the image. So this kind of process, you have anywhere from nine to 22, even more, um, layers of color that are overprinted and that completely um, work with each other as they're overprinted to make a pictorial whole. The system was after all designed to recreate printed, um, sorry, recreate painted images, oil portraits and the like, and landscapes. A lot of it is used as a 19th century goes on for a lot of cheap imagery that's used in this case, like the cover of a book, uh, just for writing exercises in. Um, and a lot of this imagery is uh, horribly mawkish and sentimental, relying on Victorian ideas of childhood and, and the like. And as such, it's um, not really uh, appreciated by art historians, but you know, there's a lot of this stuff out there, I hasten to add. When it comes to geography, we're looking very much at um, use of chromatography to, to create visualization. So here's an image, the title cover for Levi Yagi's Geographical Study of 1887, published in Chicago, and is a view of the globe as the physical object. There's no political boundaries. Uh, hanging in space, surrounded by the atmosphere, is all very poetic, but it has a claim to very similitude to, to, to visual reality. And you find chromo being used over and over again to create images that are constructions, that are created by their makers to show a theme, to show an issue, um, but in a way that claims to have vision, but it really doesn't. There's no way you could actually, anybody in 1887 could go into space and, and get this view. Um, and you couldn't do it today either because of the whole atmospheric uh, <laughs> depiction is completely wrong. But anyway, um, now most of Yagi's geographical study are actually large maps that were intended for a teacher to hold up or to put on a wall. These aren't works that, this, this wasn't a work that a student would actually have at their desk. These are big, um, large folios, about five feet wide by three feet. Um, most of them are this kind of image, regular, straightforward color litho. But then in 1887, uh, Yagi has this one image as well at the back. I should also say the box of this, uh, this, this portfolio comes in a box, the back of which the in inside back cover is a paper mache relief map of the United States, which is quite unique. Um, and then at the front, you've got a whole bunch of stuff about astronomy as well. And then you've got this one image uh, on the right here, the five zones, which draws on and, and sort of summarizes, to my mind, all the ideologies around empire and imperialism and civilization and ethnographic differences. Um, all of that rhetoric that's, that's, that's so pervasive in the late 19th century is brought into this one remarkable color image. I'm just going to show you this. Um, the three zones, the five zones, northern frigid, southern frigid, two temperate, and then the torrid zone, which by 19th century ideology, torrid zone was, uh, it was just too easy for people to live. You just go out and pick your lunch, go hunt your food. It's easy. There's no need to build civilization. It's the northern temperate zone where life is a bit harder that caused in his ide in his ideology, um, civilization to develop. And you've got it running in this zonal map from uh, East Asia through Europe. This is actually a detail of uh, almost the more than Washington and Washington, and then across to the Wash to the Western Plains, um, which are being in which Native Americans are being shown dis disappearing in front of agriculture and um, both arable and pastoral. And the Southern Hemisphere has a similar kind of rhetoric. For his subsequent work of 1895, Yagi takes all the themes in that one grand image and blows it apart into a whole series of images. Um, first of all, he has a world map of ethnographic races um, relating distribution of the so-called races, I should say, 
uh, by uh, climatic type, i.e. by zone, uh, but now focusing more on the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, he has a depiction of the temperate zone, a wonderful agglomeration of items from Europe, and there's a, there's a US capital background left and House of Parliament back, uh, background right, center and stuff. Um, he created geological charts. These are still brand new at this point, trying to under trying to show the um, the structuring vertically structuring through the crust of um, different kinds of strata and volcanic activity, and so on. There's a whole bunch of these things. Um, Etienne Trouvelot, uh, a French-born uh, entomologist and astronomer, weird combination. Uh, you can blame him for the spongy form moth outbreaks nowadays, because uh, he's the guy who let them let them loose by accident. I hasten to add. Um, anyway, so he worked for Harvard Observatory, and his specialty was was doing very detailed observations and then taking multiple compilations of those observations and creating single views, and claiming that they were this is what Mars, this is what an eclipse of the Moon looked like at a very particular moment. I mean, not just on a day, but for the case of the planet Mars, not only observed on the 3rd of September, 1877, but at 11.55 PM. But in reality, this is a completely constructed image, uh, as all of his 15 uh, astronomical images were. The claims to naturalism and to, and to vision of I think plainness in this exhibit in a set of works by John Bachman or Bashman um, of the seat of war at right at the start of the US Civil War in 1861. There are four or five uh, bird's eye views or very high altitude views in this sequence. Three of them are bound together, uh, to, can be bound together to make this single view. And this is actually was it came to us backed on mid 19th century cloth, so it seems to have been assembled into one piece in the 1860s. And in the in the fine print on here, uh, it says as seen from life, uh, or seen from nature, as if somebody had gone up in a balloon. And I should say the 1850s is when ballooning starts to really take off, and in particular when photography starts to be taken from balloons. The photographs are really, really tight. You know, there's a few blocks of a city, let's say, um, but it's appealing to, to to a popular imagination of a vision from above and seeing the world lay down below us. Utterly constructed views made real through the color layering of chromolithography. Here's a detail of Florida uh, from the third of those uh, three panels. And it's almost like you're looking down at the ships, Union ships that are blockading the, the, uh, the Confederate ports and so on. You've also got this remarkable piece by John Bashelder uh, of the Battle of Gettysburg, mapping all three or four days into one view. Um, and actually, Bashelder before the war had been um, widely employed in, in imaging uh, urban views, bird's eye views. Um, from this point on, he sort of focuses on Gettysburg, and this is the first of many, many works that he produces about this really, um, not, I mean, not only pivotal moment in the Civil War, but it becomes a uh, sacred site for the Union uh, and a place of remembrance. By the late 19th century, however, um, well, after the Civil War, I should say, the use of chromo for views seems to dry up till the very end of the 1890s into the, into the 20th century, when chromolithography gets a new life to show landscapes of touristic interest. In this case, um, and and more particularly, tourism that's accessible from ferries, from railroads, and from trolley cars. So in this case, we have um, 1915 plan around Chattanooga in Tennessee, showing the trolley lines that go out to the surrounding battlefields, and in particular, uh, 
to the right of the of the main image. There's a little detail. Um, so life is fine. But more commonly, we have this kind of image. This is for a ferry line, uh, Joy Steamship Company, um, sailing from New York out around the Cape to Boston. And these things, as you can see here, um, you can see the fold marks. They fold down, and they the paper at the, at the left wraps over. You have a nice little pamphlet which you can slip in a pocket. Uh, gives you the times of the of the ferries, where they call, um, fares. There's all the information you need um, as tourism is moving in the late in the late nineteenth century into a more um, independently driven style of tourism, which people are taking trains, ferries at their own rate, uh, at their own desire. Uh, this is pre-automobiles. Um, you have a lot of these uh, these kinds of imagery uh, being created as part of guidebooks and, and schedules. And huge images of great cities. I'm going to skip over this one. Um, and finally, you get to collectibles, um, promo coffee, Arbuckle's Coffee in 1889 released 100 um, promo lithographic maps. They're quite small, uh, each with a map of either the 50 states in one series or 50 countries in a second series, and with telling vignettes about the location and activities and stuff. Um, you could either get these singular you could collect them by buying Arbuckle's coffee. They would come in packs of the coffee, just like baseball cards would come in bubble and stuff. Or you could buy the separate atlases. You find Chromo being used on the covers and the boards of board games. Here is Nettie Bly, um, journalist who went around the world in 1889 in 72 days. Um, and here she is tripping lightly over the globe, which I like that image. But the board as well as a standard um, race board, like going back to Duck Duck Goose of the 17th century. Um, but this too is printed in um, full chromo uh, to give verisimilitude all the little logos of each space and the corner vignettes um, as well. You find them being used as giveaways or tickets on the verse of tickets for train lines and showing off the trains and the services, showing off places seen, in this case, Niagara Falls and the bridges around it. Um, things that are that are appealing to the spectacular, to the eye, uh, bringing them all the way into majority of homes in the US by the end of the 19th century. So to conclude, Wow, much is about on time. Um, there are several ways in which maps, print, and color um, work in the 19th century. You have uh, a lot of hand-colored maps, copper through by the 1830s, and then as you go into steel engraving, which are harder, they can take more impressions. Uh, they also get hand-colored. Early serigraphic printing gets hand-colored, uh, and so on. Um, a lot of hand color right up through the 19th century. And I think one of the things that determines whether an item is going to be hand colored or printed color is whether it was assembled like this image uh, as a collage with lots of other little bits from other sources. Placing them on the stone on multiple stones with multiple colors can mean the registration is difficult to ensure. So I think it's just cheaper. Um, from the boundary to the vignettes, just to do everything, print black, hang, and color. You have the tinted lithos, which in mapping terms seem to be used almost solely for uh, bird's eye views, and in some cases for um, views within uh, diagrams that are in early, mid 19th century atlases. You have straight chromo litho, where Colors are printed from multiple plates, but there are they just abut each other. They don't overlap, and frequently within the black lines that we expect of maps, we've got the three color copper plate engravings transferred to three color lithographic stones. 
or three stones for color printing in three colors um, for the engineering maps. And then you've got the, the chromo where the coloring is overlaying each other uh, for images of, of the world, for the spectacular, for the realistic, um, giving the world a sense of very similar, very similitude. This pageant of spectacles. And finally, um, this and so much more is going to appear, hopefully, in print. Uh, we haven't done a costing on it yet, so I don't know how much this will be. We're going to have all 92 images in full color and uh, the full catalog and then an essay uh, by me about all the stuff I've been talking about and more with another 41 full color images uh, in there and it will come out as soon as it comes out. But as I finished the text yesterday, it is coming out. So yay. So thank you. And I will open the floor for any questions that Kelsey is hopefully looking at. Awesome. Uh, well, thank you so much, Matthew. We did have uh, quite a few comments along the way. We've got some people clapping their hands. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to stick them in the chat. Um, you're also welcome to raise your hand. There's a little, uh, I think it's under the reactions. Uh, so well, I'll, I'll, more I'll, I'll start off by, I see that um, Stephen Hornsby is out there somewhere. And Stephen once asked me, when did three color and four color printing, modern style of photomechanical work come in? And I can I can answer that now for you, Stephen. It's sort of 1890 through 1940. There's a whole transitional period of use of screens. And um, it's really by the end of the 1930s and the 40s that the technological systems have, caught, have sort of blended with the idea of photo screens to make modern photomechanical full color. So your answer. Thanks very much, Matthew. That was my question. So you had anticipated. Oh, I anticipate, yes. I see, I remember Thank things. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, it looks like Tim has a few questions about transitions from one technology to another. Mm. Tim, do you want yeah. to unmute yourself? Oh, okay. Um, Great. Here. And um, I'm very impressed with your treatment here, Matthew, and want to discuss things more. But as you know, from the uh, 18th century onwards, uh, color is used in a lot of different ways. And so it's this, um, what you call the bird's eye view. Mm -hmm. um, and then color is applied to some of the bird's eye views, especially the Belin uh, maps and the like of coastal ports and islands that he deals with. <clears throat> what I'm curious about is what happens when the painting is supplied later by other people. Can you tell and um, give a fairly accurate assessment as to when the color has been applied to ah. an earlier print? That is um, one of the few areas of connoisseurship that is important in, in, in map work, I think. Um, there are plenty of other areas that are really important, but this is truly important. The problem is, is that you can apply watercolor at any time. And one of the things about watercolor is that it will sink, it sinks into the paper below the ink. So you can't really, it doesn't layer in the way that thicker uh, um, colorants will, 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 will lay. And so you can't look at the layering of them to figure this out. Um, you can tell what is often called publisher's color if you can find a lot of copies of the exact same impression with the exact same watercolor applied, then you're looking at um, color that's applied according to a scheme set up by the publisher. And that happens as early as uh, 1513 in Strasbourg Tonomy. Chat Van Duzer did a great article on the consistency of the hand coloring of the 1513 Strasbourg Tonomy. Um, 
in addition to that printed color of the Lotharingia Lorraine map. Um, but then color can be applied by anybody, uh, by initial owner, by later owner, by present day dealer. 1920s is when uh, the modern market for early maps as decorative items really takes off. And that's when antiquarian dealers start to break apart atlases and other picture books um, to sell off items. And if they hand color them, they can get more for the items. So there's a lot of hand coloring by modern dealers. How you tell it is just by looking and experience and trying to figure out, does that color look right? Um, you know, <laughs> well, there's, an... go ahead. As you know, there's a lot of interesting dotting of boundaries in 18th century maps. Right. Uh, and then those are colored over in some cases, either at the time or later. And in some cases you can get examples of people missing the coloring line and putting the color somewhere that wasn't dotted. Right. I'm thinking right. particularly of slave trade maps in the Ottoman Empire. There's a whole period, very interesting period, of where the Hungarians and the Transylvanians are regaining territory in the Western Ottoman Empire. And maps come out every few years with a different boundary. Right. Sometimes they're indicated with those dotted lines, and other times they're painted in hand watercolor. And sometimes the hand colored water um, doesn't match up with the dotted no. lines. And you no. don't know who's been applying what when. Exactly. And that's when and that's when being careful and trying to look for as many similar impressions of the same work um, becomes really important to understand, is this something um, common or is this something unique to an individual? There's, a, uh, there's also the level of chemical analysis. Um, Dinah Lange in Hamburg, uh, now in Berlin, did a exhibit on uh, color and maps, which unfortunately I didn't get to see, but I wrote the introduction for anyway. Um, and a key part of that is very, really available online, uh, is a discussion of the pigments used in uh, hand coloring of maps, both in the West and, and in Asia. Um, she's a, a Tibetanist herself, uh, how she got into this. Um, and that's a remarkably useful resource. So if you've got the money and you've got the skills and you can do chemical analyses, then you can figure out is something 16th century color, 18th century color, 20th century color. Um, but that gets beyond my area of expertise. Well, more questions to be pursued here, but thank you so much. Oh, yes. Great You're answer. welcome. That was a good one. We have a few more questions. Um, Robert sort of made a comment about how lithographic stones must have been quite heavy and the storage yes. of stones for future editions must have been a challenging issue. And I was telling Matthew, I was in New York a few weeks ago and popped into the uh, Soho REI store, which is apparently in an old printing building. And they found a ton of litho stones in the basement and created like this very interesting wall that's more of just a decoration. But I forced my cousin into a, a history lesson because like I could identify them at least. Right. Um, but we do have a few questions. Uh, why, Bill is asking, why did the U.S. Geological Survey use the three-plate system and not go for chromolithography? I think um, that is actually one of the big questions that I still don't know. And there has been some studies, a master's thesis on it, um, which I have a copy of somewhere. I need to read it. Uh, but Birdseye, Terence Birdseye, when he wrote about this, um, it seems because when they began this, pra this practice in the 1880s, um, they, on the one hand, in mapping the U.S. territory, they wanted to emulate the quality of European territorial mapping. So the Ordnance Survey, the Geographical Ministry of Geographical Institute in Italy, the Carte de l'Etat Major in France, all these 
grand surveys all use copper engravings for their work. And so it's sort of, if you're going to be serious in map making as a territorial enterprise, you need to do copper plates. And there's still in the 1880s a sense that copper gives the map an aesthetic. Uh, the, the lines, when you engrave in copper, the lines are all very similar in size. It's very, I mean, you're etching where you cover the plate with ground and stick it in acid. You can get slightly different widths of line. But in etching, in, in engraving, there's, there's one line width, really, that's making everything, all the letters, all the lines, all the shading, cross-hatching. And so it has a, a graphic unity that was very much appreciated. So in the US, even as copper was surrendered in the 1830s because it's just too soft, it gives way too quickly, you can't get enough print out of it. Um, some New York publishers, Colton in particular, went for, and as the Europeans did, went to steel plate engraving, um, where you, as I gather, uh, and I haven't done the work on this yet, so I may say something completely wrong, um, you use a chemical process to soften the, the steel, you engrave it, and then use another cover chemical process to harden the steel, and then you can print multiple copies, just as you would um, from copper, but the steel is going to hold up that much more. So you get the look, that aesthetic of copper without the um, without the loss of the copper itself through overuse. In the case of the USGS, I think it's, we need to go into color because um, they're also interested, as the US Geological S Survey, they're interested in scientific mapping and they actually issued maps, the, the quadrangles, just in the, the brown and the blue plates, not the black um, with the cultural stuff. So that way people could go in and sketch in uh, geological features, surface geology in particular, but also uh, outcroppings for structural geology. And so by having multiple colors, you can you can permit that scientific work to go ahead even as you're putting in the black layer as well for government and administrative purposes. Um, and they also famously went for contours because um, geology, the geological coloring is going to be visible against that background. Whereas if you do the European system where you have detailed uh, shading uh, called hashes to, to show relief, where the steeper the relief, the darker the slope, it's very bad for for showing anything above that any 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 superimposed color. I should say that the Swiss, who are really really interested in trying to figure out how to show relief accurately, given is a mountainous country, they actually did do some experiments with chromolithography, uh, specifically for the relief component of their topographic maps. Um, I will have citations for that in the forthcoming book. Huh. Um, so I think as a combination of a desire to be um, not too different from other territorial surveys that the, they're trying to rival uh, in quality, but also a pragmatic need for the kind of uses the the, the maps are going to go, uh, the uses are going to be useful down the line. I think that makes sense. Seems like it. Um... We have a few more questions. Uh, Matthias is asking uh, two different questions. The map with the flowers, so the National Bouquet, um, seems to have a raster. Was this a yep. contemporary raster or an unintended side effect of the reproduction? And then the follow-up is, if you print a dozen colors on top of each other, how come the lowest color layer still shines through? Right, OK. So the first question is a really good question. Um, yeah, so the National Bouquet is actually, so let me back up, actually. I, can, I, need, I do need to answer both questions at once. Um, the precise technique that I'm using chromolithography for, as opposed to generic of any color litho, um, chromolithography in this strict sense was created or perfected by Godfrey Engelmann in Paris about 1837. And Engelmann used to 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 have areas of wash 
on each stone, he used a crayon. Um, so if you think about a you know children's crayon pencil, uh, crayon drawing, they come home from school with a crayon drawing, you stick it on the fridge. The colors aren't going to be nice and smooth and you finish, right? They're going to be, there's going to have a texture to them. So that use of crayon, and I, if I get this wrong, Mr. Twyman, please tell me I'm wrong. I know you're there. And I know I'm probably wrong here. But the 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 crayon gives a certain degree of texture. Um, so that there's little gaps, little um that the application of the ink isn't going to be consistent. And if the inks are not completely opaque, um, then they'll overlap each other very nicely. Um, and against that, the so I'm gonna I'm just gonna restart this this share because I want to go to the very beginning of this talk. Um, because I've got an image that shows this. And let me just go back to this share screen. That one. So uh, on this one, I don't know if you can see my um, mouse moving, but on the right screen, upper right, you can see that this is a classic chromo in which you've got multiple uh, over layerings of blue and green and pink and yellow and black um to make this much more complex image um because the the it's not a, a regular dot sequence it's just more of a randomized texture however by the 1880s you have a number of people europe and america who are working with um screens which is to say regular mesh of dots um, on a glass surface normally. Uh, so a transparent glass space with, with ruled dots or something on them to which you then set between um, photographic negative and uh, a new negative. And by changing the, the spacing between focal length, whatever, this is where my brain collapses on me. Um, you can have different values on the final image, and you can do the same thing on printing. So the uh, our national bouquet, what you've actually got is a screen being used as the basis uh, for um, each color's trans, uh, transferal to the printing to a printing stone, whether it was stone or a zinc plate, um, and the the more cruder pattern you're seeing here is actually more of a moiré caused by the digital effect, digitizing process of this projection. Um, so by the 1880s, you have these these um, screens in effect. Uh, as early as the 1830s, 38, I think it is, there's a French scholar who lays out the idea of primary and um, additive and subtractive primary colors and realizes that you can you can make any color from cyan, magenta, and yellow when you're printing, add black, because black's used a lot, make cyan, magenta, yellow, K, C, M, Y, K, four color printing. Um, and so by the 20s and 30s, you have people using that with extra colors. So you've got the cyan, magenta, yellow, black, and some other colors being printed from plates, printing services, uh, established in part through screens. But it's really only the end of the 30s into the 40s that different kinds of screens are used with different densities. Uh, and you end up with modern four color printing. I do not know that made a tall lick of sense we got thumbs up so that's good um good. and then another question from him was why are up to 22 layers of colors considered cheap enough for mass production how much manual work was needed for printing these lithographs well it's cheap in the sense that once you've got the printing stones 
prepared, it's a very, it's a pretty straightforward process. You know, you, you, the printing presses are designed to, to ensure easy registration. Um, and so you can have um, large numbers of, of images, large number of colors going into each image. Now, a 22 color image is going to be more expensive than a nine color or a 10 or 12 color. Um, the mass produced work is probably going to be more at, more like 10 or 12 color than anything else. Um, what gets really interesting is when you look at the process of wax engraving or serography, where you have an incredibly delicate process of um, creating by electrolysis in, a, in an electrolytic solution, a very thin layer of, uh, of a relief surface. That uh, it's very, very complex. I don't want to get into it, but it's incredibly painstaking. And when you peel, when you when you separate the the base or the case from the shell that's laid on by this electrolysis process, the shell can break very very easily. Um, but that aside, this is still really cheap because in that process, it's very easy to do lettering. You don't have to form each letter individually. You can take regular letter type and press it into the wax that's on top of the case and do all your lettering really, really quickly um, and easily. So the, the actual preparation of the printing plates is very straightforward, except for the creation of the plate, which is delicate. And once you've got, once you've passed that delicacy and you back the plate or you made a stereotype into, a, into an even stronger metal, then you can print ad nauseum very, very cheaply, which is why US commercial publishers after 1870s, starting really with Rand McNally, 1872, really take off with serography um, right up through the Second World War. All right. And then Bill is asking, is photolithography the same as chromolithography? Um, for example, maps printed in Washington, D.C. by Andrew Graham Co. for certain mm -hmm. government maps. Are you familiar with that? Photolithography is where one's brain goes to die in a puddle. Um, photolithography, photography is chemistry, lithography is chemistry. You put the two together and it's an infinity of chemistry. The, the playing back and forth is... And, and cross feeding is is extensive and very very complicated. It's almost like every when you get down to it, every single printer is doing their own technique. And the job of the historians like me is to draw rather large <laughs> barriers around them. Right? Photolithography is a generic word for any kind of process which uses photography to transfer an image from some original drawing, let's say onto lithographic stone, zinc plate, or whatever. So Colonel Henry James, superintendent of the Ordnance Survey in the later 19th century, wanted to create a cheap way to print the hundreds and hundreds of individual sheets that were being created at very large scales of British cities, agricultural landscapes. Each sheet would only need to be printed in, you know, no more than a hundred, let's say, copies, very few copies. Not like the thousands of copies of the old and survey copper plate maps were generated in. And so you needed a cheap prepar preparation system to create a print that could be printed in a few copies and sold relatively cheaply and not lose your, your shirt on it because you know ordinance survey government agency always having to justify its existence to the politicians and so and the treasury department in particular so the solution was a what he called photos photo syncography which is to use zinc plates rather than actual lithographic stones and to develop a photographic system it's called a photo black system where you mix carbon for example, into your um, the emulsive 
surface of your of the photographic print of the negative sorry you take a photograph of the drawing by the surveyor the negative has the silver halide plus this this carbon black um component and that you can then transfer directly onto the zinc plate um, and the carbon black will be transferred to the zinc plate and from that given it's a mostly monochrome except there are some tinted color photo sync i believe they put blue in for water weights uh from a second plate um doing that way you can take the surveyor's drawings um which are accomplished at a very high degree of skill because the draftsman is very very carefully trained and convert them straight to a planar printing process via this photograph um and then you get all sorts of other techniques um in the late later 19th century you have the rise of photogravure which is an engraving process through photography onto metal plates and that's used for a lot of facsimiles of maps for example um and so on so photo photolithography is just this generic catchword for any use of photography applied to lithography and chromolithography does per se the, in the engelman technique doesn't seem to use attract photography in that way um other systems do yeah these are fun questions you're, you're stretching my knowledge here this is great yeah i'm learning a ton uh and then tim had another question uh recent and future uses of color in mapping what do mm. new techniques created by way of public expectation uh did I ask that right what do new techniques created by way of public expectation for what might be called the map's narrative potential so i guess how, how are they made for future stories uh tim feel free to unmute yourself i butchered that well thanks it, it has to do with the, the long history of the use of color a color is added to add new narratives to a map uh -huh. and in some respects you can start to think of the narrative as a different kind of thing when color is introduced because the eye is attracted to different aspects of the map or to other aspects that are printed on the map like the cartouche for example once you start um, coloring cartouche the message if you want to call it that or the narrative of the map becomes somewhat different than it was when it's just in black and white um, it's uh, dramatic in the history of the map of the slave trade any any maps in the slave trade take on a new meaning uh, when they're colored by different peoples uh, often by the late 19th century uh, for the amusement of people who are getting magazines like um, the illustrated london news or mm -hmm. uh, black and white a, a journal called black and white or another one called the graphic uh, these are often handed to kids who then make colorings on the the sure. black and white image and you get some very fantastic in a sense in both senses of the word that is fantasy driven as well as amazing um representations of what empire was and what it meant to people at the time so i'm curious about the application of color in the more modern point because it's been used to illustrate a whole lot of things once it gets introduced to curricula for example and geographies um, regularly include boundaries of, mm. of of some uncertain type but once they're printed and they're given a different color on a map um, they take on a solidity that the nation state in a sense has in the 20th century that it didn't have in the 19th century anyway sure. i'm just uh, trying to well, talk about the narrative that's conveyed by a map surely surely and i mean you're absolutely right um and none of none of those issues um are well put it this way the application of color if you can if you can make a map in color or add color to further to alter um the the cultural meaning and the how maps are going to be read then then color is going to be applied that way today um I mean, we have 
series of 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 ongoing political changes and that are definitely affecting how people are mapping the world and its political relationships one example being um the there seems to be and i have some colleagues in leipzig who are, who are working on this there seems to be a turn very slow turn away from mapping nation states towards mapping um ecosystems to to draw not the boundaries of of nation states but the boundaries of watersheds and um areas of uh defined by rainfall but of course this is being hampered by climate change um because the boundaries are rapidly moving um so there there, there are some ways in which people are, are changing but that, that's really a question of what is being colored um not so much of how the coloring is being done um but I can say I mean I, I mean it's, I think it's fairly plain that today the ubiquity of providing material online through the web is such that putting stuff out there that's monochrome um is not going to work you've got to have color in order for people to even recognize this just to spot your work um and then that's an in digital environment color is really easy to create and we can go from the digital to print very easily there's in the early 90s uh they they perfected the direct output to film devices so rather than you know, you, you you create your diagram on your on your machine and instead of having to print it out in color and then having a photograph of that taken and then have that separated out for different color printing plates, you give it to the printer and the printer generates negatives, one for cyan, one for magenta, one for yellow, one for black, and you can print it straight away. Um, the cost again, of co colors can, can flip meaning 180 degrees. What used to be a blue state is now a red state. Right. And that came about rather recently. Well, you can blame Ronald Reagan for that reasons. one. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Anything more about the techniques rather than the implications? I don't know, Kelsey, have you been monitoring anything? We have gotten a few more comments about it, and um, the catalog from the Hamburg exhibit was shared also, if anybody's looking for more information about that. Um, some hashtags. Uh, thank you, Vera. Vera oh, yeah. put a link in to um, a PDF about um, color maps in East Asian uh, in East Asia. Um, which you can download if you want um, in the chat. And Vera also very nicely, thank you, Vera, um, put in the um, is a very large PDF for the Hamburg. Uh, exhibit, uh, Color Meets Map, uh, Faber Schrift Landkarte. Um, it was really, really very cool, for, especially for the, the pigment work. Um, it's a very useful resource. And thank you, Matthias, for also for, for, for putting that stuff in. Yep, and then Lauren's made a comment. It's worth seeking out photos of all the heavy equipment needed to handle multiple stones for a single image. I can only imagine. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the reasons why in the 1840s people started switching to zinc plates so quickly. Um, I don't know about the comparative cost of a stone versus a zinc plate. I'm not, I have no idea when they started refining zinc um, in large enough quantities, but um, so yes. This is, this is really fun. I mean, I really uh, find intellectually a great deal of um, satisfaction from this in, in the sense of being able to, to see that there are these discrete kinds of maps, which is what I'm all about. There, there's no such thing as cartography. There's lots and lots of different ways of making maps. And to find that these different kinds of maps in 19th century US are being created in color by quite different techniques, or well, subtly different techniques in some cases, um, is this not just a question of economy, but a question of look and aesthetic purpose uh, really is quite gratifying to me. 
justifies my existence, shall we say. Certainly there are more than just that reason, but we're thrilled oh, to have yes. you here either way. Um, thank you, Matthew. Thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, we're getting lots of compliments and thank yous in the chat, but I don't see any other questions. So uh, if you've got another question, type it out very quickly. Uh, otherwise, we'll, wait that. <laughs> we'll also be sending out the recording of today's uh, lecture. So if you have any follow-up questions, you're welcome to respond to those emails. Uh, Tim says we should make a study of the ideology of map making in another session. Oh, no, that, that takes the rest of my life. <laughs> One session isn't enough to talk about ideology and mapping. Um, different, different topic, but yes. So thank you. Um, I will let Kelsey do the honors of closing this thing down. So thank you very much for coming. And thank you for sticking through the questions. Awesome. Thank well, thank you all very, very much. And hopefully we'll see you at the next event, which I believe is April 29th. April 29th. Um, so we'll include a link to register for that in my follow-up email. But otherwise, have a great rest of your day.